All right, welcome. I'm Katie Gorka, the Executive Director of the Westminster Institute. Uh, the Westminster Institute was the sponsor of this delegation that went to Egypt. Uh, they arrived on Friday. They had two very intensive days of meetings, um, which they will tell you about. Um, the Westminster Institute, for those of you who do not know it, is a nonprofit think tank based in McLean, Virginia. We only take funding from uh, private individuals and foundations. And we were started five years ago out of concern for protecting the freedom and dignity of people across the globe. We have a particular concern about the rise of radical Islamist, Islamist terrorism. Um, in the case of this delegation, we were interested in putting this together because we had a big concern about what's been happening in Egypt. We feel that Egypt is pivotal, pivotal to the United States as well as to the Middle East and the Arab world. So I'm very grateful for the extraordinary experts who went over there. I think that they really uh, deserve credit for the boot camp they've just been through, the travel. Um, I don't even think they were allowed to sleep while they were there. And with that, I'm, I'm just going to uh, introduce General Vallely. So the format here will be General Vallely will, will say a few words about their meetings. Uh, I think then each of the other participants will say a few words as well. Hopefully, uh, a fourth member of the delegation, Sebastian Gorka, will come in and join them. So he's just signing his furlough papers, and then he will be here. Uh, and then we welcome you to ask questions. And I just would ask that if, before asking a question, that you identify yourself. And with that, let me turn it over to General Vallely. Thank you, Katie. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see none of you have been furloughed or signed your furloughed papers like uh, Dr. Gorka. So the government is shut down, but here we are. We're still existing and breathing and so on. Well, we left uh, Cairo uh, yesterday at 4 o'clock in the morning, which meant we had to be at the airport at 2 o'clock. So flew from Cairo to uh, Frankfurt uh, to here, got in uh, last night, and uh, we're still awake. Uh, my cohorts here, uh, uh, Colonel Ken, as we call him, and his bio is in there. and. Uh, Rick Francona, uh, Air Force, and good friend of General Soyster uh, from years back. Uh, see some friends in the audience here, uh, so welcome. Thank you for taking the time. We've had uh, quite an experience uh, the last three days um, on this trip. Now, about six weeks ago, I was inside Syria, uh, and that was quite an experience, meeting with the uh, Free Syrian Army, uh, and then to come back and and then be asked to go over to uh, Egypt. And uh, my wife says, uh, what are you doing? Are you crazy? She can't quite figure it out yet. I said, I probably am, but uh, it's been a tremendous experience going back into the Middle East and looking at two of the hot spots over there, Syria uh, and Egypt, has been a, has been a really enlightening experience. Uh, I will say that uh, you have to get on the ground in the Middle East to know what's going on, to touch and feel people and look into their eyes and uh, talk to them. Uh, you can't do it from in the Beltway here. And all of you who, you know, watch the media every day and you get a lot of dialogue and on these interviews from people that seem to be reading other people's information, uh, going on the web, and uh, uh, but no people really uh, of solid, uh, real boots on the ground, as uh, they like to say. Uh, the jam-packed uh, agenda we had over there was set up by uh, Westminster Group and Tara Dahl, who worked on Capitol Hill. And Tara did a fine job, by the way. She really put this together. We had an opportunity to meet with a cross-section uh, of the people that have participated in what we'll call the Second Revolution over there. First was Mubarak, and then the Second Revolution being, of course, what they call uh, ousting of uh, Dr. Morsi. So we met with the Chamber of Commerce, wonderful luncheon with them in dialogue, leaders of uh, the commerce uh, uh, in Egypt. So they were able to uh, tell us uh, the situation of the, of the economy and what they're looking forward to in the next year. Uh, we met with ambassadors. We met with uh, academicians, uh, professors, military political science over there. Um, probably the most enlightening part uh, were, were three other meetings. Um, one day with 30-year-olds who were part of the second revolution over there. Uh, 
uh, the, the next day we met with a group of 20 year olds, I guess about 12 of them. So hearing from the youth over there of what was going on and what had happened was most revealing. Uh, and then uh, the, day, the day we left, we had two hours with General Sisi and his staff. Uh, that is the biggest uh, uh, time period that he has given anybody. No other leader of any other country has been in there uh, for more than 45 minutes. We spent two hours, and I think he wanted to spend more time with us. So it was, uh, it was historical what has happened in the change of government in Egypt, absolutely historical. And our government completely misread what was going on. It was not a coup. The army assisted 33 million who protested against the Muslim Brotherhood and what they had done and what they were doing with the Egyptian culture and the politics over there. So from that standpoint, you have to understand how close uh, the majority of the population is with the armed forces in Egypt. They have a relationship I have never seen in my life. And it is true, uh, it is solid. Uh, they're concerned, of course, about the perception from the West and from the United States. And I can tell you, they are very upset with the United States, that we didn't do our homework better, that our State Department didn't do their homework better, and it sided with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, during the protest. So uh, the relationship of the military, uh, we still have a great relationship. Uh, many of the generals uh, that we met with uh, had gone to the war colleges here, the National War College, uh, the Army War College, Naval, Air Force. And the, the respect they still have, and I want to make that clear, they respect the American people, but they can't figure out what our government's doing and why they're doing it. And what we had hoped to accomplish over there was to listen a lot, uh, understand what had happened in the last year in Egypt, and to bring back that message to the American people from their eyes. And I say that because they're tired of, uh, I guess, the United States, as they see the rest of the world, trying to push our values, push everything in our eyes uh, uh, on other people. And they would really want to say, look at it from our perspective. Be there with us and look, and then you can make your analysis. So I, uh, I discussed with Ken this morning and Rick uh, some of the key words that impress from the impressions I received over there. Number one, the humility of these people. I found the same thing with the Syrian generals who had defected. Uh, the amount of humility that they have between each other, no arrogance, uh, very sincere about what they're doing and how they're doing it, but very unsettled uh, with the support that they've not gotten from, say, the United States and other Western countries. So historical is another word. What had happened in Egypt hasn't been done, I can't remember historically, the change of government that, that has been done this way. You have to remember that they had no impeachment in their constitution. They did not have an impeachment vehicle. They will be putting that into their new constitution, which they're working on. And we met with the ambassador, uh, who is the in charge of rewriting the constitution. It's pretty much been done. They hope to have it uh, finished uh, and out uh, after the first of the year. But they've gone to the people and said, what do you want in our Constitution? They've gone to the young people. They have young people absolutely sitting on their board of about 58 who are working on this const new Constitution for Egypt. So um, that's sort of an overview. We're happy you could be here today. I think what we'll do, I'll turn it over uh, to my colleagues here, let them make some comments. And then as soon as we finish that, let's open it up to questions and answers. Is that all right? OK. Ken? Thank you, sir. First of all, I must thank the Westminster Institute for giving us this incredible chance to do what we did for the last three, it seems longer than that, three days? I'm not quite sure even where we are, but it was amazing. I mean, I lived in this town for 20 years, so I know how the powerful give um, time or don't give time to people like us. To have access right across the board in Egypt was amazing. And Thank you so much to the Westminster Institute for setting this thing up. It was incredible. Um, 
I'll fo focus initially on my brief remarks on two things. You must remember, I'm now a, no longer a Washingtonian, I'm a Texan, okay? I come from Texas where the blondes tell Rick Perry jokes, okay? <laughs> We're very proud of these things. To me, I'll always think of two things when I think back on, the, on this amazing adventure. Number one, we're in danger of losing a key strategic ally in the Middle East. In fact, I would say the linchpin in the Middle East is Egypt. If you look at a map, I know we don't teach geography anymore, but if you do, you'll see two things. Egypt is critical, not only east-west, with Israel, also north-south, the Nile. 4,000 miles long, and more people are around that river drinking its waters and harvesting its products than are in Egypt itself, which is the most populous Arab nation of 90 million folks. If we lose that, that's where I came into the picture, okay? When I, a young officer in Germany in 1973, when the Arab Israeli war began, and the big daddy rabbit then was the Russians. We were very concerned about the Russians coming across the line with us, but the Russians were also big in the Middle East. And so after that, we had a great reversal Anwar Sadat reoriented Egypt from Russia to the U.S. That process may be about to change. If we allow that, because no one in Egypt that I talked to was at all enamored of Putin. The Russians are more subtle than that. They were, they were quietly, softly, and effectively. But that's there, and don't think it is not. I looked at, this, at uh, what was said to us, and the amazing part to me was hearing what I heard. I heard generals sitting there talking to us and saying, friends do not treat friends this way. If you're talking about the law, about your law about military coups, that didn't happen here. And it's so amazing, but a basic spiritual question came to mind. They're not asking for law, they're asking for grace. But they're also asking us to be sensible about this whole thing. To me, the most amazing Dan, thing. Let me just introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Sebastian Gorka. The unemployed Sebastian Gorka. <laughs> he had to sign his furlough papers this morning. <laughs> Anyhow, welcome back. Thank We're you, just General. sorry. We'll, we'll put Glad you, you made it, sir. We're going to let Ken finish and then Rick and then have you talk and then we're going to do questions and answers. Wonderful. So keep your uh, statements as short as possible so we can get into the questions and answers. Will do. And to me, the other part that really got to me was the young people saying, why is the U.S. supporting terrorism? They consider the Muslim Brotherhood to be terrorists, obviously. Terror against women, terror against churches, terror against the people. That was the thing, I think, which got me more than anything else, is that aspect of how decisively against the Muslim Brotherhood they were. So how surprising was that to me as a political scientist to talk to Abu Musa, the guy writing the Constitution. I'm a political scientist, I know the drill, was on the Hill here for almost 20 years, I've written laws myself, and to have this guy say, we are reaching out to every sector of Egyptian society, asking them what's going on. Then there's going to be a referendum. They're asking questions about what do we do about Muslim Brotherhood? Do they, are they allowed to actually participate? And if so, as a military force, what about that? Uh, questions like, how about impeaching a leader? How do we do that? I mean, basic stuff. Um, things like, well, we have a presidential system and parliamentarian. All these things were, were going on. I was so conscious of this, but to me, it was so amazing. A high point was meeting His Holiness the Cop Pope of the Coptic Christian Church. And as a San Antonian, San Antonian, I was greatly privileged to give him the new book by my pastor, Max Locato, to say, this book is about Egypt, sir. It's about Joseph. And we're so honored to be in her presence. And what then the Pope did was to give each one of us one of these. Love never fails. If you're familiar with these things, it's, you'll recognize Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. And to have him say that, the man who'd watch his churches burned, who'd watch his parishioners slaughtered, that is something very special. You don't see that every day. So when Paul says this is a story, it really truly is. And to me, the most amazing part of this thing was on the way out of Egypt, I tried to get my pounds exchanged. I still have them, as you'll notice here. Why? Because they're not giving exchange rates back. They are in trouble, economically, in trouble politically, until this whole thing gets resolved. And they're looking to the U.S. to provide something which they have not provided, which is backing what has happened in Egypt. Until that occurs, they are in very serious difficulty. So I look back on this thing, you know what? 
This fails. This does not. <laughs> Very good, Ken. Rick? Well, again, uh, you know, echoing uh, the words, thank you, Katie, for uh, arranging this. This is an amazing trip. It was uh, a little more fast paced than <laughs> I would have chosen. Uh, but um, I don't, uh, fortunately, I had been to Egypt before because we didn't even get to see the pyramids. Now, how can you go to Egypt and not see the pyramids? I, I, kept, I kept saying, that, take them by the pyramids, take them by the pyramids. And uh, it was uh, uh, probably. Uh, one of the best trips I, I've ever had to the region. I, I, I live there and I, I've uh, talked to uh, leaders from all over, but the, the level uh, of access that we had was uh, astounding. But the, there was a, a common thread throughout all of the meetings. And uh, uh, I, I joked, I, I told the general, I think uh, they've all gotten their talking points from Egypt Central because it was always the same thing in, in every meeting. We need political support. We need you not to judge us through your eyes. You need to look at this from an Egyptian sense. And uh, the general and I gave, a, I think, a pretty good interview to Egyptian television, very penetrating questions about America's actions. And uh, we turned a lot of that back. And uh, you know, this is why is the United States supporting the Muslim Brotherhood? And we said, well, why'd you elect them? Let's start with that. And, and uh, you know, so let's, let's not, you know, this is not our fault. Uh, this is something that you're trying to correct and, and we want to work with you. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, they are looking at and they're taking very seriously is their role in, in the region and in, in the Arab world, the Muslim world, uh, because you know, a, as you know, Egypt, I consider it the heart of the Arab world. Uh, it is the biggest country, it's probably the most important. They've got the best armed forces. Um, they also have, you know, uh, El Azhar is there, the kind of the center of, of, of Sunni Islam. And also the the Coptic uh, uh, Pope, who was actually very charming, uh, by the way, in in the face of what he is facing. Eighty five churches burned, a thousand homes of Christians burned, uh, and you know we don't always see the thousand homes of Christians burned. We see the churches, and uh, talking about that, and 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 despite all that, the hope that all of these people have that they're going to be able to fix this. Um, I think maybe they're being a little naive. I think Umra Musa was probably the only one that doesn't have a really uh, naive. I think he understands because I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, the perception in the United States is that Egypt is not out of the woods. We don't know if this is going to work. You're not going to get foreign investment. The tourists aren't going to come back. I'm trying to re remember the numbers. Correct me if I'm wrong, sir. but. Uh, the tourism uh, on the one company they would deal with. It, 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 this guy, this one company we talked to, we talked to the president, and he said he, he had a big company. He said they were bringing in $9 million a month prior to the revolution. This month he took in, what was 100,000. Yeah, 100, now, now you do the math, and he's got a whole staff he's got to feed. So, uh, and, and they said we need, we need the roadmap, the roadmap being the Constitution, the elections, the new government, and then everything will be swell, and then all the tourists will come back, and all the foreign investment will come. I said it's not that easy, and and you know Egypt doesn't live in a vacuum, and there are pressures from the outside that you need to deal with, and and uh, you know we talked about a lot about Libya. They're very concerned about what's going on in Libya. Uh, a lot of the arms at the Muslim Brotherhood, the MBs as they call them, uh, that's one word there, MB, uh, yeah. MB, even in Arabic, and. Uh, they call them the MBs, and they're getting their, they they're getting all these weapons from uh, from Libya. There's just a pipeline coming through there. They're very concerned about what's going on in Syria. They're very, um, I think, they're kind of incredulous as to our policies toward the region, uh, not only uh, toward them in Egypt, but what we're doing in in the rest of the world or what we're not doing. And uh, I, I think a recurring theme was, uh, and whether it's true or not, it's their perception, is you are the remaining superpower. You need to be doing something. Uh, not necessarily what we should do, but but we need to be doing something to do to to address these issues in the region. They were very uh, very concerned about. It. So they said that you know uh, they realize how important Egypt is to this part of the world. They wonder if we know how important Egypt is to this part of the world. And uh, it it was it was very telling. Um, I I did uh, play devil's advocate quite a bit of the time. Uh, and in both languages, because you have to do it both, so they understand what you're saying. And uh, they, the military coup thing, 
uh, and they said, here's the answer. Here, here's, here's what you can tell your government. It was not a coup. It was the people rising up. I said, and General Sisi telling the Army not to intervene. Uh, that might constitute a coup. And they, they were nuancing it out. And, I, you know, I understand what they're doing. Um, but it was, uh, I, I think, illustrative. It was, it was fascinating. And uh, I'd be happy to share, you know, in, in response to any, any specific things you want. But um, I think we all came away with the same feeling. I think the Egyptians are more united in this than we might think. Of course, uh, that being said, we, we did talk to most people that shared the same view. We did not have access to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, we were not able to arrange that. Um, but and I, don't, I think we would have probably gotten a, a whole different perspective. Uh, uh, and one thing, as you drive through the streets of Egypt, uh, I can read the graffiti. And I, I always, I'm, I'm a graffitiologist, I guess. I, everywhere I go, I read the graffiti because I think there's a lot of truth in graffiti. And, and so I would, I would translate, as we were driving by, what some of the graffiti was saying. There's still a lot of Muslim Brotherhood support on the streets, a lot. And they come around every night and repaint over the, they, they paint it out, and the next day it's there again. So there's still people there. They're still willing to fight. So Egypt is not out of the woods. Thank sir? you, Rick Sebastian. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> apologies for being late. Um, I, I'd like to uh, make some comments in a purely personal capacity. Nothing I say here represents uh, DOD or any other government agencies uh, take, uh, most decidedly not. Um, I'd like to thank the team um, because it was a whirlwind tour. And uh, they put up in good humor. Um, and uh, really, I think, provided the Egyptian people with a certain level of comfort they haven't received officially from anybody else, not in government, not from the ambassador, not from the bilateral relations. And um, I think the thirst they had to talk mm. to Americans who were open to hearing the other side, the non-Muslim Brotherhood side of uh, events, uh, was very clear. It is correct. Whoever we met sounded as if they were um, coordinating their messages, which I know they weren't, but whether it was the youth, whether it was the members of Tamarod, whether it was General Sisi himself, the Pope, everybody had some key themes that they wanted America and the administration, and most importantly, the people of America to understand. The first was, again, this was not a coup. They used the term, this is the second revolution. The removal of Morsi was the second phase of the revolution. The proof that it wasn't a coup was very clear. The people collected 22 million signatures to hold an early election because the government was failing. The military said, sir, we think it's a great idea. Would you go and have a referendum? Because then you could reinforce yourself. So you have the military saying to Morsi, if you get the right results in the referendum, the next three years, nobody's going to question you. You're going to stay in power. When he refused to give in to the 22 million, another 33 million went onto the streets in a country of 80 million. Could you, one, of, one of the people said, remember, if a million Americans went onto the street demanding a referendum, what would the reaction be? Yeah? Here's 33 million. And then General Sisi says, sir, um, we're going to have to do something. We have a week to respond. And then he gave him 24 hours. And finally, when he refused to respond to the will of the people, Morsi was removed. But how can it be a coup if the military doesn't take control? A civilian interim government took control, and a civilian constitutional council is drafting their new constitution. So this is not a case of you know, the old guard sweeps in and the general becomes the president. This is an expression of the people's will. Secondly. The Muslim Brotherhood are not the people. This is a message that came across again and again and again. One of the young students said it very eloquently. The Muslim Brotherhood won the elections fair and square, but then for the next 12 months, they governed for themselves. Every, every decision that was taken was for the benefit of the Ikhwan, for the Brotherhood, not for the people of G uh, Egypt. Third theme absolute incomprehension from behalf of our interlocutors as to why the government here was supporting the Brotherhood. Absolute lack of understanding. And we have some incredible photographs from the, the actual second revolution, the, the, the days that removed uh, Morsi, of English placards being used by the people on the streets where they said if, that Morsi is terrorism. Why does America support terrorism? In English, being carried by the Egyptians on the streets. 
Um, they wanted us to be very clear, and the, the, on the ride to the airport, on the way out, they said to us, please understand, this isn't about um, hating America. We love Americans. We don't understand what your government is doing. They said, we've been your best ally in the region, best Arab ally for 30, 40 years. Why are you doing this to, 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 to us now? Um, the takeaways, they said, don't judge us by your criteria. You took hundreds of years to build a democracy. You had a civil war. It takes time to, t to work these things out. We need understanding, we need time, and don't cut off support to us when we need it the most. The analogy they gave is, um, would you threaten a friend with blackmail? Even if a friend is doing something wrong, you try and assist them, you try and talk to them, but you break the relationship if you say to a friend, you know all the help I've been giving you? If you don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm cutting you off. That is not how you maintain a relationship with a trusted friend. Lastly, from, from my own macro uh, analysis or, 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 of, of the relevance of this trip, everybody is obsessed with, well, everybody is obsessed today with the, the government shutdown. But if we, if we get past the government shutdown, if you switch on the TV or open a newspaper, what is it? Syria, 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 Syria. Syria is practically irrelevant when contrasted to Egypt. Yep. Egypt is the center of mass for the region. As has been said, 88 million people, the most important theological institute in the whole of Sunni Islam is in Al-Azhar. If we lose Egypt, forget about the region. The interconnectedness of the weapons coming from Libya into Syria, into Egypt, it's not about Syria. It's about Egypt and the future of that country. Um, for me, it's all the more important because this is the home of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is where Hassan al-Banna in 1928 created the organization that works hand in glove with Al-Qaeda. Every key member of Al-Qaeda was first a member, member of the Brotherhood. If Egypt can reject the brotherhood, America will be safer. Egypt has rejected the brotherhood. We need to, as their ally, do exactly the same. This is all the more important because of what's happening in Turkey. Turkey was the shining light, the example of how to build a secular Muslim state. I've been to Turkey recently. We are losing Turkey. Turkey is going anti-Atatürk. You do not see the statues, you do not see the mosaics, the Atatürk. His secularization and creating a modern functioning uh, Turkish state is being taken back in time. If we lose Turkey as the model for a stable Muslim state, then Egypt has to step into its shoes. And the brave people that we met are trying to create a functioning modern Muslim state. America should try and help them. Thank you. Very good. Well, I think with that, uh, one other key issue I'll mention before we go to the questions. Uh, uh, one other key issue uh, is the uh, inclusiveness and exclusiveness of the Muslim Brotherhood in the future over there. We have to understand the Muslim Brotherhood is very well funded, very well organized. They're experts at PR. They're ex extor uh, as far as uh, what they put out. Deception, a lot like uh, the Russians and the Iranians use. They're very good at it, and we're not very good at it. And the Egyptian leadership uh, realizes they haven't been very good at it. They, they did not get the message out as they should have, and they realize that. But the, uh, the inclusiveness, something you may want to examine, is that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has three legs to it, okay? It's got a political arm. It also has a military arm and support of... Uh, of Islamist, uh, and third, their international global reach uh, of the global caliphate. And so the Egyptians realize if you're going to be a political party, an entity, you can't have a military arm, and you can't have a, a further extension uh, of what you want to accomplish in the world with a global caliphate. So they're wrestling with us now. How do we be inclusive, but yet we can include the Muslim Brotherhood with those three legs? So it's just something to consider. Any at this time, why don't we uh, open it up to questions? Claire? Uh, I want to take you back to the economy, um, if you would. Uh, what did you hear about uh, their, their prospects going forward economically? Um, they, they, they cannot support themselves. They've destroyed their own economy. 
Uh, they've been bailed out, at least temporarily, by the Saudis, the UAE, the Kuwaitis. Um, how do they see that relationship with those countries going forward? Do they expect more largesse from them? Um, or how are they going to manage uh, great question, Claire, and, and we did go into depth with two different groups on that, particularly the uh, s senior members of the Chamber of Commerce over there. Uh, they realize that the, the lifeline to them now is to the east, to the Arab countries that are supporting them and not to the west, and um, because they're not getting anything from the west, not getting understanding, not getting support, and so th they're forced to do that. Uh, their plans for national security, of, of protecting uh, the sea lanes, uh, the Suez, uh, uh, they know that's critical. And General Sisi said, we will protect it. We're going to protect that supply channel for the world. Uh, we'll be doing more in the Sinai because of uh, that vastness of, of that desert region. has got to be secure also uh, in order to protect uh, commerce uh, from that side of the uh, of, of the river or the Suez. So they're very in tune to that. They, they know that they're, they're juggling a lot of different things now, but uh, uh, tourism and the economy is right up there as one of the top uh, things that they have to do. But they have to secure and be stabilized. And the, only the armed forces can continue with the stabilization of the country, allowing them to grow and to attract foreign investment. Claire, the German banker lady who explained to me in Frankfurt yesterday about why she couldn't exchange this. She said, it's too unstable. We don't know from one day to the next. When you hear that, you realize that what is behind the true human cost we saw in Egypt. Worst traffic I've ever seen, ever. Imagine New York City without any rules or traffic lights. That's Cairo. You think it's better on 95 Springfield exit? Nothing. <laughs> Go ahead, Sebastian. But that's an infrastructure question, okay? Because if you don't have an efficient infrastructure, you cannot make economic progress. For those kids we saw, there are poli sci graduates, but they're all unemployed. Yeah. Think of the energy that's there. And by the way, an energy that they can be used for good or bad. So it's a very critical juncture for us economically as well as anything else. If you can't lead economically, you can't lead politically. And right now, their need is economic more than anything else. The average Egyptian is only two bucks a day. The, there's also a, an information campaign uh, aspect of, of the economic question. Uh, the head of the American Egyptian Chamber of Commerce told us that uh, one day he was uh, contacted by a fraught individual who wanted to have confirmation uh, for the media that uh, all the um, American car companies are closing down because of this so-called coup, that they're basically shutting down their plants. And, and he, of course, knows all the American CEOs, so he rings them up and he says to the, the head of Ford, why, why are you closing down your plants? And he said, we're not closing down our plants. We're just shutting early for the day because of the curfew. But if somebody can send a message that Americans are pulling out, yep. and one of the things they said again and again and again, how do we get other governments, the British, the French, the Germans, to remove us from the threat advisory for tourists? We were there. It's not, there's no danger on the streets right now, but there are no tur the, the hotels were absolutely empty. Well, this is a nation that up to 20% of its income comes from those tourists. But if our State Department, if the, if the British Foreign Ministry is saying, you know, this is on a, a, a do not fly uh, list, then then we're going to imp we're going to actually accelerate the the economic downturn in Egypt through our own lack of understanding of what's going on. Rick. And while we were there, they, there was a summit going on about foreign investment. So they know that this is critical. They also know that they're not going to get foreign investment until they figure out, uh, until they get a government in place. And this is going to take a year. Right. So their biggest concern is how do we bridge that gap for that, that one year? And they're, they're uh, as the general said, they're relying on, on the, the Gulf, uh, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, whoever, somebody to come in there and provide them some funding. Because uh, they know they're not going to get it from uh, the West. That's their lifeline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Ken. Uh, um, welcome back, uh, all of you, uh, from a whirlwind. Uh, did you learn anything about uh, the Egyptian investigation into Muslim Brotherhood involvement in Benghazi? <coughs> uh, no, that didn't come up. Uh, what came up more than anything, Ken, was Libya and what's happening in southern Libya uh, with the amount of arms there and the training camps for Al Qaeda. <laughs> that are now um, 
landlining uh, up to uh, Syria to support the um, to support uh, the uh, Al Qaeda Al Nusra uh, forces uh, in Syria. They're watching that very carefully because they figure that border with Libya also is uh, highly exposed of threats uh, inside of Egypt. So um, the, the whole dynamics, they're watching it very closely, uh, but uh, they talked a little bit about Tunisia and um, the threats over there as well and what's happening in Tunisia, but uh, didn't really get into Benghazi. Didn't have time, Ken. Oh. Did, did they see Libya as a kind of staging ground for al-Qaeda coming oh, yeah. back into Egypt? I would say yes. That's why that border there is very important, and they have secured it. Uh, and the intelligence over there, they're watching that border. At yeah, least that was my uh, perception. As best they can. It's, it's 1,000 kilometers long. And they've got very limited resources out there to secure it. They're doing the best they can, you know, using uh, aircraft and such. But yeah. it's it's a real problem, and they, they mentioned that over and over, the they Libya do. angle. On Libya, the hard news we have for you, I've never seen this before by the U.S. press as a report, but they told us that there's a problem in getting the AH-64 Apache attack helicopter. That's part of, apparently part of the slowdown that they've been dealing with. Now, why is that critical? It's critical for two reasons. Number one, in any kind of domestic insurgency situation, it's a very precise instrument. In Bosnia, we use that all the time because the gun camera stuff on the Apache is far better than anything else that flies. And so you can operate very close in with very little collateral damage. The other thing is that it can also widen out your area of view so you can use it for surveillance. Particularly in the Sinai, right? Can right. Really Sinai on the one hand, Libya on the other. So wherever you have the problem, the Apache can provide an answer. So that's one specific example of where we're not supporting them the way we should. The other was the aircraft, uh, Rick. Uh, yep. What was it? The, they're they're yeah, going F4s. back to the yeah. F-4s. They're yeah, they, in the parts and then going back and keeping the MiG-21s. Yeah, they've, they've been forced into this uh, uh, situation now where this, with the stopping of the delivery of F-16, F-16 parts, uh, that that stops their modernization. They still have got about, uh, what, 48% of right. the Russian stuff, the East Bloc stuff. And what they've been doing is taking the F-4s out. The F-4s are gone out of service because they're too, too expensive to maintain commercially. They, there's no longer U.S. government parts for the things. So uh, they were trying to, they, they can do less, they can do more with less F-16s, replace those. But now they're having trouble doing that. And the same thing with the Apaches. They're having to cut back some of the operations in the Sinai because of the, the, the maintenance issues with the Apache. Uh, so they're, they're uh, using MiG-21s uh, now. I, you, you know, God, I remember MiG-21s when you know, I was 19 years old. Because you know. they can get the parts out of the Ukraine. Yeah, right? you can, get, you can get parts yeah. for them. By the way, that shows you what we're talking about when we talk about the Russian possibility. Because right. you can go one of two ways. If 40% of your stock is Warsaw Pact former stuff, you can either go that way or toward us. It's their choice, but they live in a tough neighborhood. They must choose now. Yep, exactly. Katie? Um, one of the big criticisms of the military here in our press has been their heavy-handed use of violence. Did this come up as a topic of discussion? Oh, <laughs> yes. There was one, if I may, no, he's one fine. superb anecdote. Um, <laughs> so there was a certain square that, was it Al Jazeera or CNN was reporting on? <laughs> Uh, sorry, a certain channel unfriendly to the uh, revolution was showing live feed from a square where violence was occurring and they were using this to underline the brutality of the regime. At the same time, an Egyptian who lives on that square looked out his window, saw nobody, and then started to film what was going on and gave it to an Egyptian domestic channel so they could put the falsified use of force by the government up against what the man is filming now, who is an empty square. So this is the level of, of information campaign that's being executed right now, yeah. the generation of violence. Um, and, and one thing that struck me on the Apaches, if this is such a, a dangerous group of uh, you know, military coup-oriented individuals, why would the head of the Egyptian army tell us specifically? Well, it's not, it's not you know, this gentleman's analysis. It was the general. The general said, yep. we can't do precision-guided attacks on the bad guys if we don't have Apaches. He's concerned that I don't want to hurt people who are not bad guys. It wasn't you know, us 
It was him saying, I want to do this, but in a way that takes out the, the uh, MB or the Al-Qaeda. So uh, it's, it's all connected to the, the information campaign. Okay, great. John Swisher. Uh, recognizing you were talking about Egypt internal all the problems we have, did anything come up about uh, Israel? Either our views, or their concerns about our views, or whatever? There, there, was, there was one half a sentence from the general, which is very interesting. We, one of us asked about how's the regional cooperation going uh, because all of this interconnected threat. And he said, uh, we have some cooperation with certain uh, neighbors, and he listed them, and he said, and there's one other country that is very helpful. Another neighbor in the region. So, yeah, it was diplomatically put. But the concern about the tunnels over there still uh, on the, what, the old Philadelphia line there between Gaza uh, and Egypt is still a big problem transferring weapons, uh, al-Qaeda growing over there. Uh, and what the Muslim Brotherhood does economically, as, they, as, as Hezbollah has done in southern Lebanon, they put a lot of money into the local villages, uh, medical, uh, food, things like that. So they really uh, participate out there in those villages to win the people over, and they do it with cash, and they do it with goods. So they're, they're very well organized. But at the same time, the militant arm over there supporting al-Qaeda operations that are attacking uh, villages. Uh, they killed a, I think it was a brigadier, uh, police, yes. uh, police uh, in, in Egypt. Um, so they know they have a continuing battle there. And that's why the Sinai is so critical because really, like southern Libya, I mean, it's a fertile ground for uh, bringing the recruits in, training them, and then sending them out on operations, not only internally in Egypt, but externally. Yeah. They've located more than 150 tunnels in the Sinai already, the Egyptians. And the trouble is now the, the tunnels are coming out inside uh, private houses into closets. So now the challenge is what's left? How do you locate those uh, remaining tunnels? And, and to your question, sir, uh, my impression was that of, of their neighbors, Israel is the least of their worries. That was the message they were giving us. Yeah. Were they? Yeah. Continuously. Okay, next. Yeah, I wanted to get you, I want you to talk about the youth, because we were talking about the youth in America. Uh, and uh, the, um, as I said, uh, so I'm glad to see some of you younger people here today, because I was more impressed over there um, in some ways with the 20 and 30 year olds and how active they were oh. and how aware they were and passionate, uh, and passionate about the situation. Um, so anyhow, sir, go ahead. In the back, you got a question. Yeah, I'm far from an, an, an expert on, on Egypt, but um, in talking to one of my colleagues who has been there several times, she was wondering why is it that um, you know, the secularists and, and Christians and the, and the, uh, the moderate Muslims trust the military uh, to handle power well? Mm. One of the things which I find fascinating about Egypt is the fact that it is a state relying on conscription. We, of course, in this country do not. I reminded General Sisi, I said, look, you must remember, in the U.S., only 1% serve. 99% don't. Consequently, the army is them over there. In Egypt, it is us. Because every individual, when he reaches draft age, serves. Only males, but that's a Specific, specific thing the society demands. Same thing, by the way, in Israel. So there's a level of trust because everyone has served. They understand what the army does. Consequently, it was not them over there, it is us. And one of the things that came across very strongly, I mean, I'm a child of the 60s. To see young people relying on the army was amazing to me. It gave me a warm feeling down inside because I realized when you have that, which by the way, our founding fathers thought we should have too, not just a draft, but the idea of the integration of the, what Clausewitz called the war of the people of the army. But they're almost always together. In Egypt, that was absolutely critical to the nation. Okay. I, I think it also em, em, empowered the people. They, I think they felt comfortable going out into the streets because they have that trust of the army. Uh, and General Sisi made this point several times. Uh, he said the Egyptian army has never fired on Egyptian civilians, and they never will. Now, whether that's true or not, you could argue, but that's, that's their feeling. And that's generally the perception we got from the people that the army was probably the most trusted institution in the country. 
Uh, the only other place I've seen, you know, the closeness between the, the, the Army and the people is Turkey has that same thing, that same feeling. That's true. Uh, and of course the, the Israelis, as you said, but but I and I, you know, I'd worked with these Arab militaries before, but I I, uh, I had forgotten how close the Egyptian army is to the people. But I was skeptical about General Sisi before I went to Cairo, and my opinion has completely reversed, especially based upon one thing he did, and this might explain your your answer your question. Before the military took any action against Morsi, after the 22 million signatures had been collected, after the 33 million had gone onto the street, General Morsi sent a, made a press statement. And he said, I don't know if you recall, it was about um, a month ago, two months ago. He said, next Friday, would the Egyptians please go out onto the street because uh, we would like to measure our legitimacy as the army as to whether we need to take action against an undemocratic president. Now, I was skeptical because I thought, hang on, it's your job to protect the nation, not unarmed civilians. But when we discussed this with him in person, it was clear that this is a man who said, we have no other option. He said twice, if we don't remove this person who represents only his cadre, his clique, there will be a civil war in Egypt. And he said, I have the choice of doing nothing or a civil war. And instead, I'm going to ask the Egyptians, do you give me the authority to remove this person who is undemocratic so that we can come in and create a new civilian administration? That is remarkable. And that's why our, my colleague here said, he, Ken said, um, this is almost Washingtonian, he, taking off his saber yeah, and saying, I am a military man, but I'm going to remove the person who is exploiting his powers so that other civilians who have legitimacy can replace him. It was quite incredible, the depth of understanding of what democracy and legitimacy is coming from a general. And can you imagine, for me, the dean of the War College, listening to that come from that guy, from his lips. I said to him, you're our sons and brothers. We taught you. You did these things on your own. So the analogy with Washington is very well formed. He did that. Newburgh conspiracy, and also after he was one in Yorktown, resigning in Annapolis. That's an amazing uh, kind of legacy to look back on. OK, thank you. Uh, in the back, and Jenny will come to you. Chris Farrell, Judicial Watch. Dr. Gorka, what you just communicated concerning General Sisi is utterly lost in the American public. Yep. <laughs> it has never been expressed or articulated I know. at any level I know. whatsoever. I know. Ever. So uh, why? How is that message lost? Not oh, gosh. Very specific, very specific guys. <laughs> they know how to communicate. Right. They know how to get their message out. Right. But somehow that translation has not been made in any form right. other than what you've just provided. Do you, want, do you want the three-hour answer to that question? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, 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 I'll respond with you know, an illustration. How is it that an individual who says she has a PhD but doesn't is associated with the wrong parts of the Syrian uh, civil war, um, is fired for lying and completely misunderstanding the ethics codes of being an, a specialist, and then is hired the next week by Senator McCain? I mean, uh, that's why we have a complete in, uh, incomprehension here. And the other thing I think the general said or somebody else said, we're very busy here. You know, they're focusing on, on getting it right for the first time in 7,000 years. You know, should we have a president or a prime minister? Where, what do we do with the, the status of Jews and Christians? How do we protect them in the Constitution? You know, they're, they're not, you can't blame them for not having a cogent exterior information policy. And in the meantime, that vacuum is filled by the Brotherhood and everybody else who wants to misrepresent it. So for me, it was a wake-up call. I went there skeptical, and I walked out of this thinking, man, would I like to have some generals like LCC in the US Army. Yeah. Right? Really sterling stuff. The other part of that question that I'll answer is this. When the media turns from watchdog to lapdog, yeah. Nothing else is going to happen. The reason why we have a free press is to keep an eye on the guys in the White House and Congress. I say this very conscious of the fact that I'm in the National Press Club. <laughs> what you must also remember is the three of us here were lied about by the New York Times, libeled. 
Actually, that, that spawned four separate congressional investigations over three years. We were eventually vindicated. So we saw up close and very personally what happens when the media lies. So you ask the question, why have we not been told the truth? Frankly, that's what they yeah, do not yeah. do. And the, the perception problem uh, that the Egyptians have, and they've not done a very good job explaining it. And I, I think, Sebastian, that was the best ex explanation I've ever heard of why it wasn't a coup. But uh, I, could, I could sit over there all day, and, and I'd done this, I did this. Uh, tell me why it's not a coup. And they nuance it, and they nuance it, but they're not doing a good job selling it. Right. Yeah. Jenny? The same players about Benghazi, the same players about Fast and Furious, the same players about Extortion 17. Uh, that's why the big argument or discussion is, uh, are, are they doing it because they're totally inept uh, in the world affairs, or is it by agenda and by design? So that continues to be a question, Jenny. And Sebastian, you may want yeah, to this, add this to Yeah, this is a very important question, and, and we can talk offline about names but le let me tell you <laughs> le let me tell you uh, what a certain individual did in a very high position so there's a, a, a an individual who is tasked with understanding terrorism and radicalization in America and he goes to another country to study it and comes back just as the country he's studying realizes their whole system for dealing with al qaeda is collapsing and has to be completely changed he brings the failed recipe from that allied nation to the White House and develops our system about three years ago. And this is, the, this is the nature of the beast. This is what is driving all our policy and our mistakes in the region. This individual gave the following analysis. In the world, there are three classes of Islamists, meaning those that are interested in a caliphate. Three classes, okay? There are the purists who believe only in dawah, in proselytizing and education. So they sit in the ivory tower, and they will educate about the Quran, and eventually enough people will convert or will believe that the, you know, the caliphate is the answer. Second are the political Islamists who say preaching is not enough, education is not enough. You've got to create a political party. You've got to win elections, get out there, and grab control. Of course, this is the brotherhood. One man, one election, once, right? The third group are the violent Islamists, the small number. This analyst who's now a very senior uh, individual in, in the NSS, said these are three hermetically separated groups distinct from one another, and the future security of America lies in us legitimizing and working with the political Islamists because they can save us from the violent Islamists. So in English, we had a policy decision made three years ago that the MB will save us from Al-Qaeda. That's why we have people from here being sent to see Morsi in prison, and General Sisi gets nobody. We were the people who went to see General Sisi, and we're not an official delegation. But we can talk about names and numbers later. We have names. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, this gentleman at the back. I, I guess I have two points and uh, one question. The, one, the, the first point is, I, it's pretty much a military coup. I mean, like all the numbers, like 33 million, 30 million, 80 million. I was in Tahrir Square um, during the 18 days uh, before Mubarak stepped down, and the capacity of Tahrir Square is no more than eight, 800,000. And we were saying, like, these two million people on the street, so I, I'm, I'm skeptical when it comes to Egyptian saying numbers. I'm Egyptian myself. The second, <laughs> the, the second thing is, um, I, as much as I respect the church, my church, but I'm really frustrated the way that they are dealing with the suffering of the cops. Since you met with Sisi, and my question for all of you, um, why, why Sisi didn't protect the churches? Why Sisi didn't protect the Coptics now. Right. Yesterday there were a family forced to leave from Elmenia where CC forces are around Elmenia. 
why the Coptics are, until this moment are not perfected? Right. Why the Coptics right. cannot be in a sensitive position mm-hmm. in the government? I think, you know, I think it's, it's yes, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood are utilitarian uh, regime, but, you know, the rest, there is no founding fathers in Egypt who dream of democracy. There is no Jefferson, there is no Madison. They are all like seculars, and they're defining themselves like we are not Islam. Uh-huh. So the answer is not like what what you have to give is like we don't have something to give, but we are not Islam, uh-huh. and I don't think any democracy can be built on numbers. I, okay, on the on the numbers, um, he, nobody said there are twenty two million people in Tahrir Square. They the general said that in Suez, in the north, uh, across Egypt, they, those are the numbers. And he said, Google Earth it. He said, you can go to Google Earth on the date and actually work out the rough estimate. And it's not Cairo downtown, it's Egypt. So uh, I leave that for you to, to check. On, on the Copts, um, my impression was, and, and maybe my, my colleagues agree, that one of the big reasons, one of the, one of the explanations for the violence in the beginning was because the Egyptian police were not capable of doing their job. There were some serious issues with the police being able to secure those places where violence was going to be imminent. Now that's changed. If you look at the Sinai, the police are working in collaboration with the military. So there's a far greater quality control because it was realized the police don't have the respect, don't have the capabilities the military do, and now it's got to be done side by side. On the Jeffersonian issue, I agree. I mean, I spent 15 years in the land of my parents, Hungary, uh, after 40 years of communism. Democracy is not a shake and bake venture. You know, Jeffersons do not come out of the womb. Yeah, uh, these individuals have to um, find themselves. They have to work out the answers for themselves. They all they're wanting is for us not to push them. The whole time that we hear from them, we're being pushed. Have an election now. Have an election now. Well, if they have an election now, you're going to see what another bad result. It's got to be done properly. They've got 50 people now in the Constitutional Committee representing all walks of life, from students to cops, uh, farmers, peasants, you name it. And, and they're saying, we can't work this out like that. It's not going to happen. So um, I think we should give them time, and maybe a Jeffersonian individual will develop, and it's not for us to say when it should occur. Uh, if I could just add to that, um, uh, the, the, army, the Egyptian army is not a monolithic organization. They're not all good guys. There, there, are, there is an element of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Egyptian army, e- even in the officer corps. Uh, and General Sisi knows that, and he, and he did ask us for that one thing. He said, I need time to fix this. Uh, unfortunately, in that period of time, uh, you're going to have violence like that directed against the cops. And uh, uh, the Pope was, uh, you could see he was visibly, uh, when he talked about this, visibly moved and shaken. Uh, I don't have an answer as what the solution is, but I mean, they're aware of it, but they know they need time. And, uh, you know, the Egyptian army, for as good as it is, does have some bad elements in it. Okay, can I have one more question? Okay. Who, who, uh, well, gentlemen back, that's cool. Patrick. 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 Yeah. Um, the U.S. ambassador uh, Ann Patterson, former U.S. Mm. ambassador, widely vilified in the protests, and there was a lot of media criticism. Uh, was there any sense uh, from the officials you were meeting with about uh, the, the new U.S. ambassador and Patterson's elevation to a new position uh, within the State Department? Um, she was a hot topic <laughs> in our discussions with everybody, and uh, totally uh, blindsided in a way by her. Uh, uh, she was evidently so inept, didn't do her homework, started siding with the Muslim Brotherhood immediately, and um, the amount of uh, disgust that the, the people had for Ann Patterson, and they were very happy to see her depart. I'm not sure the school's out on the new ambassador, but uh, that's, that's part of the, the uh, equation over there, that they couldn't understand how our State Department could misread everything so badly. But what you must remember, in both Egypt and Libya, the ambassador represents one person, the president. So whatever he or she does or does not do, thank you, that reflects on that one person whose responsibility it is. Never forget that. Okay. Good. 
time. Katie? Chad? Chad, I think that's it for right now. We can stop talking afterwards. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. You we really appreciate it, and we will be available. Uh, we'll have our contact information. Be happy to answer any further questions via email or through uh, Westminster Center, uh, uh, Dr. Gorky and uh, Katie. So. Uh, will be very open to all of that. And, and we are compiling a report, so there will be a summary report of the whole trip available at Westminster. He, because he now has a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Furlow. Yeah, that's me. Get your yeah. Egyptian money there. Oh, yeah. Hey. Good. It's good to see you, too. I, I would have asked.